Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll start just first talking about what the task itself. So what is content-based image retrieval? So the task is uh, well, it's, it's simple. No. So you have a large data set of images, and then you have something in mind that you want to search. For example, this particular tree. Um, so the task is to to compare so to to retrieve all the images that are relevant to that visual query. And for doing that, you just analyze the pixels of, on the images, not using any text data or any metadata associated to that. So, okay, this is a, a demo. This is a, a user interface that, okay, the name is not that Paula Duran uh, developed. And it's a, an interface for a real um, content-based retrieval system that we developed. And yeah, so as, as you can see, so you have, um, you have the, the option of looking uh, on different data sets. Uh, okay, maybe I, I stop. Okay, er, stop. Uh, okay, well, you have in the top uh, the option of select which data set do you want to search, and we, we have applied uh, three um, common baseline, which, uh, which are Oxford, Paris, and Instra data sets. And then on top, so you can choose uh, different visual queries, and then you select that, and then the system just retrieves uh, the relevant information. And you can do that on, you, uh, searching for images, uh, searching for images within, uh, okay. Well, you can look at that later, okay? Um, but the idea is that, okay, you have a query and then you, you just rank from most relevant to less relevant all your, your images in, in your data set. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay, this task has been there for, for a while and before deep learning was a quite uh, a lot of approaches that we um, that they, 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 they proposed um, most so usually this is the kind of uh, schematic for, for for the system no? so you have visual query and then you and your data set of images and you, you choose an image representation so you don't want to work directly with the pixels because it's not very efficient and that's not a really good representation so you compute something on the on the pixels and then you come up with a, a, a vector of numbers and then you compu compute that on your query and in the same way on your data set images and then you have to have a way to compare um, the query representation with the queries that you have in your data set usually people use something like uh, cliff and distance or cosine similarity um, and then yeah once you com compute the, the, the similarity scores then you rank from most relevant to less relevant, all your, your images. Um, uh, traditionally, this was approached uh, um, with uh, local handcrafted features, such as SIFT, and a very common um, approach is using the back of visual words model, which is kind of understanding each uh, local feature as a word in a text document. So you can uh, build a visual vocabulary, so you, you extract these local features from your all the images in your data set, and then you build this uh, uh, large visual vocabulary, so you can then take all your local descriptors from your image and then assign uh, each one to uh, the closest centroid and build a kind of an, an histogram of uh, yeah a histogram of how many words do you do, do, do you have no um, and this is uh, so was widely used because it's uh, very efficient to, to to have so the vectors actually are very are very large. People is using vocabularies of uh, one, what, 50Ks, 1 million, even 60 million. This is a very large vector, but the good thing is that it's, you don't have numbers in all the dimensions, so it's a very sparse vector. So it's very efficient to store that using sparse matrices on, on, on disk, and you can use um, a structure like the inverted file, uh, so you can do the query fast. So one of the things that, uh, so this works well, but it's, mm, you miss something, because when you do this uh, aggregation from local to to the global representation, then you totally lose the um, spatial coherence in your, in your image. So usually um, the back of visual words is used an, as an initial search, and then you follow that by doing something more expensive. So then, okay, so with the initial search, you have like kind of, a, you have filtered your data set of the possible relevant images that you have uh, for your query. And then on the top, I don't know, 100 results, then you can run something more expensive and people um, uh, exploit like the, so you compute for each of the descriptors that you have in your query, and then you can compute um, the, the matches to a data set image, and then you can uh, estimate the anomography transformation from the coordinates in your query to the data set image uh, using uh, like something like Ransack. 
and, and then you can uh, refine your, so in the, your top 100 images, you can refine the search based on, on applying these techniques. This is great, it works well, but um, it's expensive to compute because yeah, you might have like, I don't know, a uh, thousand descriptors in your query image and a thousand descriptors in your data set image and you have to process and compute this matrix for all the top results that you have. So that can be expensive. Okay, that just like a brief, a very quick introduction about what was done before. Um, and now I'm gonna talk about, okay, so we're here because it's a deep learning seminar. So what, uh, how do we do that with deep learning? So the first and the kind of the most kind of logical thing to do is, okay, we have really good networks trained for classification. Let's wanna reduce that for, for, for this task, okay? Uh, and the first approach is what, okay, so this is, you have seen this before, this is AlexNet um, architecture. This has been um, trained for classification. So, okay, the first approach uh, was just taking, okay, let's represent the, the, the image uh, with the vector that comes up from the activations in the fully connected layer. So a single image has a representation in this case of uh, 4,096 dimensions. And yeah, let's you do that to, to represent the query and the data set images and let's see how, how it works. And it works uh, well, it doesn't work as well as the traditional approaches, but it was uh, like something like surprising. No? So you, you can use uh, descriptors from uh, CNN to for classification for, for this task. And then, yeah, in the early approaches, um, some tricks like uh, doing data augmentation on the query and data set images. So instead of just, just uh, extracting one single representation per, per image, you can do data augmentation so you can flip your image and then you can do some random crops and extract a bunch of uh, descriptors. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can, and then do that at different scales. Um, you can really boost the performance, but uh, you boost the performance at, at the cost of having to process many times, many little images, and then to increase, by increasing the size of your data set. Um, so, okay, can we do any better? So you can uh, think of as a fully connected layer as a way to aggregate um, local information from, from convolutional layers, because convolutional layers have uh, special dimensions, so that means that they carry some special and, and, and local information somehow. Um, so the question was, okay, is there any way, any other, and is there any other way to pull all this local information instead of using a, the fully connected layer from, from my network? And it was a, a quite number of uh, approaches uh, back in 2015. So the most simple one, I guess, is just doing, okay, you have your tensor uh, in the convolutional layer, just do some more max pooling across the different channels. Um, that looks like that, no? so you have, this is the volume of, you know, in a convolutional layer, so you, have a, you can interpret that as a number of different uh, feature maps. So you can compute the max or the sum um, within each, each map so that kind of pulls the, from the tensor you go from, uh, from H by A, uh, W by D, you go, you pull the information and you just use an n-dimensional, so d-dimensional vector. And this is great because, uh, so if you're using something like BGG and work with um, uh, the, the top convolutional layer, then you represent the image with just uh, five, 12 dimensions, which is quite good. Um, and then another thing is that if you um, for, remove the fully connected layers, then you can work at uh, the original um, aspect ratio of the images at higher resolution, and you can also map. So if you know that the, the, the instance or the thing that you are interested to retrieve it's, uh, it's not the whole image, but it's just a local part in the image. You can map um, the bounding box of your query to the, back to the convolutional um, uh, layer and just pull the information within this bounding box. So you can, yeah, you can encode uh, the local information that you want. And then another thing to, to work with uh, the, these layers, uh, so the, the first approach uh, uh, was proposed by this paper, it was very simple. So they, they work with a um, data set that uh, was ba uh, were based on buildings. And usually in the buildings, you know that the, once you take the image, the instance that you want to retrieve is gonna be centered mostly. So what they applied before doing the, the sum pooling, uh, they applied uh, just a Gaussian weighting, just providing more importance to the locations in the, in the center. And that was boosting the performance. That's very simple, but it, works. it worked for that data set. But you can also do something more clever, you can, do something that depends on the content on, of, of the image. Yeah, for instance, you can uh, sum um, the activations across, the, across the, the, the feature maps, so you get a, 
a kind of a, a map with different weights that depends on the content that, the, that you are processing. No? So you, you just zoom across the dimension. And then you get something like this. No? So you, you get a map that uh, it's, it's sensitive to, to, to the content of the image. And that uh, was shown to, to boost performance a bit more. You can also weight uh, differently the different channels based on the sparsity. But it's okay. this is uh, what is explained in this paper. And you can use something more, more fancy, which is, uh, OK, why not take uh, like saliency, saliency models? So saliency models are based in, in how the humans we do look at the images. No? So use these weights uh, to, to provide, to, to weigh the importance of the, the different regions in, of, on your image. And that turns out to, to work really well. That's what we try uh, in this paper. So, OK, one of the questions that I guess I, I had when I was working on that is, yeah, but, but max or zoom pooling, so what should I use? No? And it turns out, and if you look at the literature in some works, uh, people is doing max pooling because it works better. And, but then in another data set, then some pooling works better. And it's, OK, so which one? And actually, it's none of them. So you can use something called the generalized mean pooling. So you can uh, think as a max and uh, an average or, or some pooling. Uh, just the difference between average and some pooling is just this scalar factor. Um, you can think as an special cases of this generalized uh, pooling, where you, you have this kind of view. So you take the, 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 the activations to the power of p, and then you uh, sum and normalize. And this p can actually uh, be learned. Or you can set this p, or you can learn that p. Uh, that's what they propose in this paper. And um, so this visualization is nice. So it's, it shows, OK, so if p, if, if p is equals to 1, uh, this is the projection of one of the feature maps back to the image. You get something like, like this. No? If p have, um, it, it's bigger, then you, you, get, you, you narrow um, the, the places that are important. You kind of um, focus more. You, you, you get something more, more narrow. And then if p is 10, then clear. And if it's infinitive, it's, it's the case of just max pooling. And that means that you are just taking one of the activations. Um, OK. Another approach, uh, I also proposed in 2015, uh, that was quite relevant because many, many people is using that now. So it's uh, the RMAC, regional max, maximum activations of convolutions. These are the settings you can check in the, in the paper. They work with a pre-trained BGG, and they take the um, Convolutional layer, uh, so from pool five. Um, yeah, so that's the idea. So you, you remember max pooling is the same idea, but they do that locally, and they predefine a set of different scales uh, with uh, an sliding window approach, so fixed positions, and they extract so from region one max pool from this region, and then so on, um, and then okay. So, but if you do that and you don't aggregate, then you multiply by n the size of your data set. So they aggregate all of the information, all of these um, uh, max pool vectors um, after uh, doing a preprocessing that consisted in, in L2 normalized, PCA weighting and L2 normalized. This is a, a typical pr um, post-processing of the features that work well. Um, so you, you basically just sum all of, of, all of the regions together, and then you have um, one, uh, 5, 12, one single vector that represents the content of your image. And yeah, so if, if you pull that, that works well. But um, that also, so if you don't pull, you can compare the information locally. And you kind of, you have, you can, you can have uh, the localization of the object that you are looking for. So in the first row is just the AirMac, the global descriptor. Um, in green, uh, green means um, so good, uh, um, correctly retrieved image. Uh, red is false positives, and it's like the top, I think it's five, top five, or the top eight, eight ranked images based on the query. So the difference between pooling or not is like a, by not pooling, then you can find where is the, so my query is this building here, and if I just look at region, then you can find where is the, so you do localization kind of for free. And, and actually, uh, in the second one, um, the doing this like post-processing on the top results, uh, really helps to improve performance. So you, by doing this analysis on, on the lo local regions, uh, you can remove a lot of false positives. Um, OK. What else? So OK, you can analyze region uh, by, by the re different regions. Uh, what else can we do? And you can do also some of the traditional techniques. Uh, so back of visual words, VLAT, Fisher vectors, techniques that were used for handcrafted, local handcrafted features. You can also apply, so if you think, you think uh, that that's an assumption. It's not really true. And probably uh, we will talk about that in the difference you know, between the CNN descriptors and the traditional ones. 
but you can uh, you can think on, a, on on this volume as a again as a set of of different local descriptors that you can so each one can describe a particular region on, on your image, and then if you think like that, then you can apply traditional techniques. So the back of visual words that I was mentioning before, you can apply that on this kind of, of features. And the good thing of doing that um, is that you can actually represent the content of the image in, in this uh, assignment map, which is very like uh, cheap to store because you. So this is just uh, you you store the um, cluster assignments, and it's, that's just an integer number that it's quite efficient to store in memory. And, and the good thing is that if you are looking for some local information, then you can easily map uh, the region that you want to, that you are interested in on, on back on the assignment map, and then just create the back of visual words representation of your, of, your, of, your, of your region. And that back at the time, back at the time means like two years ago, but back at the time well, um, uh, was working very well and it was comparing like positively versus the sampling. Um, and then, yeah, this, you can, by this technique, uh, what was shown to be like quite sensitive to the kind of um, weighting that you, you were using. And uh, yeah, so we have an extension of the, of the work uh, that we propose using back, the back of words um, using saliency, um, saliency models to, to respond performance. Uh, yeah, okay. So, okay, this is on, on the um, pre-trained networks. Um, so what about yeah? So what about optimizing something that is for the task that we we want to solve? And why do you want to do that? Because yeah, so classification it's some, it's similar to the task. So probably if we, if we want to retrieve a chair, it's going to be useful to know that this is a chair. But we don't. So a classifier model will classify a chair equally, like all these chairs, like the same. And in retrieval, we do care about the comparison. So we want to retrieve the most similar thing to to, to this example. So it's, it's not, so the concept of comparing things, it's, it's quite important. And it's not explicitly done in a CNN for classification. Um, so okay, so what loss function should we use? Um, and the loss function that the people use and, and is shown like effective is uh, this uh, same is, uh, the same is loss, which is, looks like this. Uh, that was applied for um, metric learning, uh, um, uh, what, is, what else? Uh, learning local descriptors, uh, and then for face um, recognition as well. Uh, so the idea is that you have um, two stream networks that share the same parameters, and then you, you, your input is going to be a pair of images. And basically, you, there's two classes. If, is this the same or is not the same? So your input can be or positive or negative. And then in the top, then this CNN generates an embedding, a vector. And the last function, what it's going to do is um, try to minimize the distance between um, the descriptors if, if they are both uh, come from the same thing and maximize the distance if they are from different things. Uh, so that's, that's what is expressed in, in this. So this positive term is when D is one, which means that's, that the pair is the same thing. And you basically just minimize the, the Euclidean distance. And this negative term uh, is for the pairs that are different. And is expressed by this hinge loss, which has the, this um, this is an hyperparameter that you that you that you set, and the loss function looks looks like this. So if the distance of the negative pairs is um, less than a, a certain margin, then then you you want to optimize that. You want to make this this, this distance larger than uh, this m. And then another extension is to to use this the triplet loss applied for face recognition. And basically, instead of having just two, two inputs, now you have three. And then you have an anchor, and then a positive example to that anchor, and a negative example. And basically, what you want um, is like the, to make the distance between the anchor and the positive example smaller than the distance between the anchor and a negative exam uh, example by a certain margin. This is what is present in this loss. OK. Um, OK. And the most important is how do we get the training data? That's uh, really the tricky part, and that's uh, something that I struggle a, a bit <laughs> during my, my thesis. So, yeah, um, most of the uh, retrieval data sets in the literature, there are many retrieval based on buildings. And that's good and it's interesting because the training data you can get from, from if you have GPS annot uh, annotations, then you can easily, easily build your training set. So, for instance, uh, things like Google Street View. Uh, then you can go to a, a particular location, so this is a sample bar, 
um, and then you can, um, for the particular location, you can have pictures at different times. And yeah, and that's very useful to, to build this, this training data set where you want to, to, yeah, to do this semis or, or triple learning. Um, you can, if you don't work with uh, GPS data sets, so you, I don't know, you want to retrieve like, something that is not buildings, um, then probably you need to go to, to a search engine uh, to specify some set of uh, categories or tags, and then you crawl the images for this category. And then you need a strategy to, to clean this data because if you have uh, noisy data, you are not going to learn anything. So you need either, okay, so hire someone and then do the annotations just to make sure that a class is really that class or use things like mechanical torque or um, try to use something automatic. And again, for buildings, uh, we have really strong retrieval baselines that you can use for, for automatically clean your data. That's what is proposed in these uh, CBPR papers. Um, and then also very important, once you have your data set and your data set clean, um, it's not really a good strategy just randomly sampling triplets or, or pairs of images because you will notice soon that most of the triplets, um, they kind of uh, easily accomplish the, the requirements of your loss. So you want, for instance, if, if this is your query, you want as a negative example something that is like um, similar to that query. You don't want here a picture of a dog because the network will easily know, uh, so it won't learn anything. Uh, yeah, and this is like, you can check like all our like, mining strategies in these two papers. Um, okay, and now I want to briefly um, describe uh, two approaches. So this one is uh, NetVLAP, and the idea of this paper is, VLAP is one encoding technique. It's an extension of the uh, back of visual words where you have uh, your space of local descriptors and then you, um, you can um, run the k-means and then find the clusters. And instead of um, encoding the number of times that the, the number of descriptors that fall in this, um, in this cluster, you encode the differences. So the difference between your descriptor and the, and the, and the cluster. And then you build this uh, VLAT vector. So uh, in this paper, they propose a, a method to kind of learn um, this encoding within the network. And why can't you do that like straight away? Because this assignment step. So this assignment step means that you have or either zero, uh, one or zero. And that's not really good when you want to back propagate the gradient because that's not differentiable. So what they propose here um, in, the, in the point where you want to assign one local descriptor to a, one of the clusters, um, you, you use a softmax version of this assignment. And they find out actually that you can easily implement that with a, a normal linear layer with a, with a softmax normalization um, or activation function. Um, so it's just, once you know that, it's just like plug-in Lego because it, the, all, the, all the blocks here, it's like you can find that in, in all the deep learning frameworks. Um, okay, that's what they do. And then the fine-tuned AirMac version. So you remember the AirMac. Um, and you remember that I mentioned that, yeah, they specify a set of scales and locations. Um, this was not really, so this was fixed regardless of the content of the, of the image. So that's, that's not really a good idea. So what they propose in this, in this paper is by using a triplet loss thing and, and by building their, their data set of images, they propose to, to learn a region proposal network to find out the locations where you want to extract the, the descriptors. And, and yeah, and you optimize that uh, by using the triplet loss that I just introduced before. Um, yeah, and this is an example of, okay, how, how it looks. So these numbers are mean average precision. Uh, this is, a, yeah, how you evaluate your performance in a retrieval uh, benchmark. And as you see, so if, if you use the normal AirMac, then you get this performance. The higher, the better. If you use the fine-tuned one, uh, then you increase up to 78 point. So the, it's kind of, it's, yeah, it, it works very well to, to do this uh, learning. Um, yeah, and then I want to just briefly mention, so once you have your, your ranking list, this is not deep learning or anything, it's just a trick. So um, how, how you want to boost the performance? So you, when, once, a very simple thing that you can do is just to take the descriptors of the top retrieved results, uh, average them, and issue a new query. And this really works well, especially if, so if, you, if your query works, so if your results are, are very bad, then it won't help you. 
But if your resources are kind of uh, noisy and yeah, some of the queries are okay, some are not, it's, it's, it's gonna give you a, a big boost. Uh, but then recently there is a new paper um, that they propose uh, something on the same idea, on the same spirit. Um, they propose uh, another mechanism to improve um, the, the results of its ranking. And it's based in, in something uh, in diffusion. I don't want to explain uh, a lot. But it basically, so you have to build a, a graph of your data set of images, and then you apply um, that diffusion process to extend. So once you know, so you query, it's gonna be like extending the labels of, you, you have, it's, it's gonna be more like, a, if it, it, it is, is this relevant to my query or not? So a binary classification. And then you know uh, your query, and then you, you build this similarity matrix, and then it's just like back, propagating your, um, your relevance label to, back to, you, to your graph. Uh, um, and yeah, so it's, I like this figure. So the idea is that imagine you have this, this data set, you have no labels, but you can see that this is uh, one class and this, this is another class, okay? If you use Euclidean distance to compare your query to the other, uh, to all the elements in your, in your data set, without considering the kind of the structure, how the, how the data falls in the space, um, you use a Euclidean distance and you, you get this uh, kind of, the biggest is the point, the most relevant to the query. But if you use uh, uh, the diffusion mechanism to build your graph um, based on the pairwise distances between your points, then you can kind of uh, follow the structure the, of your data and then retrieve uh, correctly this class. Um, yeah, so in this paper they apply this idea and, and they really like do very well. So they achieve uh, this performance in Instre, Oxford, and Paris, uh, like, uh, nearly 90%, 95, 96. So it's, they, they solve the task in these two data sets, and they do really well in the Instre. Instre is not buildings. It's a data set with more random stuff. Uh, so it's something like, interesting to take into account. And yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah? Questions? <laughs> 